morning, everybody. Let's stand to our feet. Who's ready to worship this morning? Who came ready to worship this morning? Amen.
shout of praise this morning. Can somebody lift the shout of praise this morning? Holy and worthy, Lord. And we praise you. We praise you. Because yeah. the joy of the Lord is our strength.
church Let the light in the road Hail, hail, light of truth Let the light in the road Oh, hail, hail, light of truth Let the light in the road We declare up this morning Hail, light of truth In the middle of your circumstance In the middle of your circumstance This morning we declare that this morning church, but I just begin to invite you. I invite you this morning to just begin to release your worship to the Father. Very transparent, very vulnerable to his presence this morning. He's here and I want you to experience that this morning. I want you to come as a worshiper, not an expectator. Come and begin to worship this morning because he's worthy to be praised.
moment that I wake until I lay my head, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. I'm Pastor Victor from Trinity Fellowship here in Fayetteville, Arkansas. We would love to invite you for Miracle Sunday, April 21st. We would love to see you. If you are needing a miracle, we would love for you to come at 10, 15 a.m. And later on that afternoon, we're going to finish off with a night of worship. We're going to have an intimate time of worship with the Lord. And we would love for you to join us and be a part of that. We're going to have a great day.
I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be fun, right? So next Sunday, it's going to be a special day all day long. We're going to have a set up across here, some chairs, and we're going to bring seven or eight individuals, depending on who all can be here that day, but seven or eight individuals who have experienced miracles, miraculous healings or otherwise, in their life that are that are not that cannot be refuted those kinds of things and so um because you know you hear a miracle sometimes you're like well somebody had a headache they took a bc powder and it got better you know i'm talking about i'm talking about documented kind of healing where people couldn't hear and now they can where they uh where they had the cancer or whatever and it's gone i mean god brought them back from the dead those kinds of things next sunday you're going to get to hear those testimonies and, uh, and we're just going to be, be, be believing the Lord for more of the same. Amen? We, we call it Miracle Sunday. We can't tell the Lord to do a miracle. We, we don't know if he's going to do a miracle that day or not. It's not up to us. But we can prepare for that. We can, we can be excited about that. We can welcome him to do that. And we can prepare ourselves to receive anything that he has for us. And so if you need a miracle, when this service is over, go out there into the gathering hall. You'll see a cross. There's some tabs and some pens. You can write on one of those tabs the miracle that you need and hang it on that cross. And then fast and pray this week between now and next Sunday. Just be fasting and praying. We're going to bring that cross up on the platform. And we're going to just pray over those needs. Some of those people will be right here in the building. We're going to physically lay hands on them, anoint them with oil. Amen. This is what we do. This is what we do here at Trinity. This is what we do. So I uh, hope that doesn't make you uncomfortable being in the presence of the Lord because this is what we do. So uh, we're very excited about that. That's next Sunday. I want you to make sure that you're a part of that. And then that night we're coming back for worship to celebrate everything that we got to enjoy that morning. It's going to be a, just a cool all-day thing. So uh, make plans to be a part of that. We want you to do that. Well, I have a, a great friend here with me today, a couple of great friends and I'll bring him up here in just a second. Um, I want you to hang on at the end of the service. Don't take off because we have baby dedications. We're going to dedicate, I think we're dedicating nine babies today. Amen. Isn't that exciting? So um, always excited to do that. And uh, I want to dismiss our youth today as circles. They do their intentional discipleship today. And they are ready to go look at them. There they go. So you, wherever you're at, you're in that age group, this is for you. You are dismissed to go be a part of Circles today. But while they're going, I want to bring my good friends Max and Tara Martin up on the platform. These are our missionaries right out of the house to Costa Rica doing Teen Challenge. And uh, I don't know what's going on, Max. You told me that Tara was coming, but we're not going to make her if she doesn't want to. But we're going to make her stand. you got to at least stand, Tara. you got to at least stand. We want to see you. Turn around. Let everybody see you. Do the wave. Such She is so awesome. You're such a lucky guy. You're what we call around here an overachiever. I'm the president of the Overachievers Club, but you could be the vice president. <laughs> Tell us what's going on in Costa Rica, man. Okay. Hi, everybody. How y'all doing? Um, so I just wanted to share for just a couple of minutes and number one, say thank you. Uh, this is our home church. You guys have been amazing, super supportive. Uh, we are so blessed that y'all sent us, uh, to Central America and South America. Um, every month y'all give financially and I just want to give like a little report. I just want to glorify God and say, Hey, this is what he did. So as quickly as I can, uh, we moved to Central America uh, seven years ago. February 22nd was seven years. And we got to open up a Teen Challenge, which is a year-long discipleship uh, program. Men come straight from the streets in cardboard boxes, smoking crack cocaine, alcoholics. Um, alcoholism is a whole different level down there. The guys will even like drink rubbing alcohol. Um, 
I mean, they don't have any money, right? And so it's whatever's cheapest and does the job. And so um, we get guys who are half blind. You know, they bust the blood vessels in, in their eyes. And um, guys addicted to crack cocaine, which is now practically free in Central America uh, because they don't get paid money in order to transport the cocaine from Colombia to Mexico. They get paid in cocaine. And so Costa Rica has no military. They have no radars. They have no Coast Guard. Um, they only have two little bitty airports, and so it comes in there in waves, and they got to get rid of it, and so they make it into crack, and I mean, they're practically giving it away, and so it has ravaged our country. Uh, one out of every 20 people is seriously addicted to cocaine in one form or another, or alcoholic. Um, that's 5% of our entire nation down there. It's very, very hard. Um, so we got to open up one of the first teen challenges. And we were content with like a 16 bed person center. Um, but God knew that the need was much greater than that. And so we ended up opening a 46 bed center. That's where we're at now. Uh, we opened a center for the guys after they graduate. We have a farm and they can go live on the farm after they graduate and get a normal job and work this farm and not have to go back to the same streets and houses they were in. So it's like a halfway house, it's 15 beds. That's another center. Um, we opened up a women's center and we had 12 beds and the Joyce Myers ministry gave a bunch of money to open up a larger center in downtown San Jose. And so we have a 30 woman bed in San Jose. And then the greatest need was for women with children and women that are pregnant because there's not one center from the south of Mexico all the way to Chile for women who are pregnant and women who have children. And so um, we got to build by the Lord's grace and you guys were a huge part of this building project, a center for women with children and women that are pregnant so that they can leave the streets and leave their problems and leave their pimps and get off and, and do what they need to do. Next month, we get to graduate our first lady from the center. So we've only been open for like 15 months. And next month, we'll have a girl who has spent 12 months and been fully discipled. And she's ready to go home and do what she's going to do. Um, <clears throat> and the Lord has just poured out. And we're so blessed. And our Women's Center for Children is at full capacity. There's no more beds. Um, we had to take our office out and put two beds in the office because the need is so great. And so we have a plan to build four more bedrooms. And then we're done because when you have that many pregnant ladies in one house, that is like super scary. It's way better to just build another house in the other side of the country. And so when I get back, the other side of the country has never had a Christian rehab at all. And so we get to plant the first teen challenge on the Pacific coast, which will open up May 17th, which is crazy. Um, and we're starting to multiply. And God's been in this. And I am so under-equipped, the Overachiever Club. I mean, I'm shooting the moon on this thing, man. And God is just with me, and I don't understand. And then there's two countries left in North and South America that don't have a teen challenge. One is Bolivia. No. What's the one that speaks English? Belize. And so Belize, they shut down their teen challenge in COVID, and they never were able to reopen. And in Colombia the drug trafficking capital of the world, they haven't had a teen challenge open in over eight years. And they had to close because there was people getting murdered inside the teen challenge. And so my wife and I have been praying and praying and praying, Lord, please send someone to Columbia. And then he called us. And so we're going to move our family to Medellin, Colombia, probably around 2025. And when we were praying about it, the only word I got from the Lord was go. And that there's a price that's going to have to get paid. And I think that price is just development of my character. Because I'm woefully ill-equipped to go into Medellin, Colombia. And to see God do what he did in Costa Rica. But I know that God is powerfully equipped to do that work. And so... That's where we're at. That's our journey. And that's how you can pray for us. And we're starting to multiply in Costa Rica. And I don't even have to go to the other side of the country anymore because we've raised up so many leaders. I mean, I have 
12 grown men that are in full-time ministry and full-time pastors who are being trained and equipped as missionaries to go to all parts of Latin America. And we're just so blessed that we get to be a part of this. And I hope that God gets his glory from our life. And I really appreciate you guys for participating in that, uh, for being a part of that. Um, it costs now about $200,000, $230,000 to run the centers that we have in Costa Rica. Um, and so we make chocolate. We live on cacao farms. We pick the fruit ourselves, and we make some really good chocolate. And uh, we have some for sale today in the foyer. Um, we're also opening up in Midtown Mall. Shout out to the Adiers. Woo. And, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get that going because part of what hinders is not God's spirit, but it's the finances in order to actually go. And this has gotten so big. We have to have a big vision in order to walk in, in the direction that God's called us. And so, you know, you could buy a bar of chocolate. You could write a check. You could come and see us on a mission trip, which is pretty fun. Um, you can pray for us. You can fast for us. Um, there are literally hundreds of people, like no exaggeration, hundreds of people giving their lives to Jesus Christ in these centers in Costa Rica. And we hope someday to see that happen in Colombia. And it just goes straight into the heart of the devil and go straight into the heart of the thing and open up a center to be light and to equip people to reach their own country. So that's, that's all I got. Thanks. <laughs> you better take this with you. I can't read it anyway. It's probably in Spanish. So any of you that, if you own businesses and uh, you'd like to sell some chocolate, you could, you could probably talk to Max. and they sell the, the chocolate's really good. You should get some when it's out there and check it out. It's dark chocolate. It's the real chocolate, huh? Oh, you got some milk chocolate. Well, I'm excited to taste that. I've never had that. And, and I like chocolate. Amen? Does anybody here like chocolate? So uh, I don't want them to leave here with any chocolate. Buy all the chocolate they got and uh, support them if you can. I'm going to tell you something. I, I say this about them all the time behind their back. I talk about y'all behind your back all the time. I just want you to know that. And I tell people, I say, Max and Tara Martin, I say, you could drop them in the desert and two weeks later come back and they'll have built a city. It's incredible the entrepreneurship the Lord has blessed them with, the ability that they have what he didn't tell you is that when they went to Costa Rica, you know, he told you about all the centers that are raised, the ones that are starting, all the cacao and all, all, everything he told you, none of that was happening before they got there. The Lord has allowed them to do all of that. And it's amazing. Uh, almost a year ago, it had been about 10 months ago, uh, about 10 of us from here went and spent the week with them. And we got to firsthand see everything they're doing. And it is, I'm telling you guys, it's amazing. Uh, you could not, you can't support, but there's a lot of great missionaries right out of this church. You know that. You should support all of them. But I'm going to tell you something. You'll never support a missionary that is any more effective than what they are. I've never seen anyone get as much done in the amount of time that, that they've done it. They are incredible. So uh, <clears throat> it's always a blessing. Max is one of those guys that anytime he's in the country, whether I got him booked or not, Max says, I'm coming home. I'm like, well, come on. Come on to Trinity. And we have, we have several like that in our church, though. Anytime they call me that they're missionaries, they're all out around the world. And whenever they're home, I'm like, well, come on. We want to hear from you. But um, I'm so glad that, that I've been looking forward to getting to see them and so glad that uh, they were here today. Uh, they need to show you pictures of their youngest son riding on a horse in the jungle like a surfboard. <laughs> First time I saw that kid go by when we were down there, He's standing on the horse's back, riding through the jungle. I said, that, that, now that's, that's a first for me. So get him to show you a picture. But <clears throat> good stuff, good stuff. Man, I'm glad you're here. Get your Bible, turn to Acts. We're going to be going there in a minute. 
don't take off out of here when church is over because you're going to want to be here for these baby dedications. But I want to talk about, I want to talk about the word suddenly. And all of us have heard stories about people down in Florida walking their little dog along the beach and an alligator comes out of the water and suddenly and eats their dog. I probably could have came up with something better than that, but... Have you heard the stories about that? Have you seen the videos? People are walking their little dog and the alligator snaps and all of a sudden they're standing there like, well, where did Fluffy go? (laughs) Suddenly. Hey, I'll tell another story. Maybe this will be a better one. Several years ago, some of us on staff were on a trip and as we were coming home, we were passing a place that looked like good fishing and we obviously we had our poles with us. And so uh, Shannon Bratton was on staff at that time. He's not, I don't know if he's in here or not. He may be working in the back. But uh, Shannon, is, he is the ultimate fisherman. The rest of us were all just, you know, just, we're just leisure, leisure fishermen at best. You'll be able to tell as the story goes further. <clears throat> but uh, we all kind of scattered out around the dam and we're fishing. And all of a sudden one of the guys hollered, I got one, I got one. I look over and his, his pole is bent. And he's trying to reel it in. I mean, he's working. And so I got excited and I ran over there. Another one of the guys ran over, three of us standing there. And this guy's reeling in this fish. And we could tell it's a big one. And, and just about the time he got it to the bank in his flip-flops, he realized that it was one of those alligator gar. And so he's trying to get it in, but he don't want it taken off his feet. And so... We all started screaming, Shannon, Shannon, because he's the only one that's going to know what to do in this situation. But it's amazing what suddenly can do when, you, you know, when you're standing there and you're fishing and suddenly somebody catches a gar and all these grown men start screaming like 13-year-old girls. <laughs> Shannon, come and save us. I'm reminded of a... A story in Scripture, in Luke chapter 2, tells the story of the birth of Jesus. You remember that? Joseph took Mary to Bethlehem, paid taxes. While they're there, Jesus is born. He's laying in a manger because the motels are full. Shepherds are out in the field watching the sheep. Luke 2, 13. Suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of angels in the form of a choir singing and filling the sky. Just like that. Out of nowhere, all of a sudden, su- suddenly gets our attention. In any story, suddenly, if you're telling a story and, then, and you're going along, you say, we were driving along, and suddenly, and everybody's like, what happened, what happened suddenly? That's what we want to talk about today, suddenly. Sometimes God is a suddenly God. Did you know that? Sometimes he's a suddenly God. Sometimes you don't hear anything out of him for a long time. In fact, in your opinion, it's been way too long. And then suddenly God shows up. Paul came to understand the suddenness of God in at least three listed encounters. He experienced God suddenly. I'm going to point those out for you this morning. Get your pen and your paper. Some of you will be able to relate to some of these sudden encounters that Paul had with God. And all of them take place in the book of Acts. And uh, if you do a study, I mean, you would, you would find these yourself. If you're just reading through the book of Acts, you'd be able to discover these yourself. But the first of Paul's sudden encounters with God happened in Acts chapter 9, verse 3. And it was a sudden light. So what you got going on there is Paul's on his way. He's persecuting followers of Jesus because at this time he's not a believer. He hates believers. And he's spending his life persecuting them and, and having them put to death. He hated Christians. He believed Jesus was a fraud. Then in verse 3, here's what it says. When Saul had almost reached Damascus, a bright light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, the one you've been persecuting. And this is the DWR translation. Stop it and instead start serving me. And I read that, I read about that, and I've preached about that, and you've heard about that, and we could spend more time on that, but we don't really need to. I'm just making a point right here. But for me, what, su- what, is, what is important about that is the suddenness for some people when the lights come on about God. How many of y'all, the lights came on for you about God in a sudden fashion? You were just kind of living your life. You know, you were just kind of going about bu- your business, doing your thing. 
you weren't really paying much attention to spiritual things. You weren't really, you really didn't have God in your, on your radar. You were just living your life. And then suddenly God showed up. Is that hap- did that happen to anybody? You could relay your experience. You could give your testimony today. You could, t- you could encourage all of us. If I would hand you that mic, you could talk about how that suddenly, man, my life was going along this way. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, God just got my, he just shook me. He got my attention. And I saw this or I saw that or I, this, I was involved in this. or Suddenly, God got my attention. For some of us, it was a very sudden thing. I don't know if you were 5 or 55. It doesn't make any difference. But when God was ready, he suddenly revealed himself to you. And this is the first of the sudden encounters that happened in Paul's life. It was life-changing. This was his salvation experience. This is him going. I mean, a lot of us were, how many many people in the room were sinners? We were all sinners. We all still are. Saved by grace, right? But some of y'all were worse sinners than others. I'm not going to look at anybody in particular. Some of y'all were worse sinners than others. But none of you were as bad as Paul. Because I don't know any of you that as mean and ugly as you might have been that were actually going around killing people just for being believers. And for you to go from that to being one of them, that must take a sudden encounter with God. I'm, where are you going, Paul? I'm on my way to kill some Christians. Suddenly a light knocks him off the donkey, and the next thing he knows, he's one of them. Did that happen in your life? Anybody that happened in your life? Well, Jesus kept doing that kind of stuff over and over in our lives. He continues to, hey, I want to take you to the next one, Acts chapter 16, verse 26. Paul then, after he, he, he's given his heart to, to the Lord, he's become a disciple, he started doing ministry. He's doing his very best, man. I mean, he's out there now. He's, he's got the same zeal and zest about serving the Lord that he had when he wasn't serving the Lord. So he went from killing Christians to now he's doing everything he can to bring people to Christ. I mean, he's, he's putting his all into it. One, I say Sunday. It probably wasn't a Sunday. I, some of you can relate to it better because this is when we go to church in our culture. We go to church on Sunday, and we used to go on Sunday night. Y'all remember that? Back in the day, we used to go Sunday morning, Sunday night. So this is kind of how this story went down. You had Paul and Silas, they're having church on Sunday morning. They're preaching, having church, doing, just doing the best they can, doing what they think they're supposed to be doing. And they were violently beaten and chained up in the city of Philippi. Crazy crowd attacked them, uh, beat them up. They're thrown in jail. And there they sit. The jailer chained them up. Jailer has to guard them with his life, right? About midnight. They started up the evening service. Some of y'all can relate to that. Having church that morning, got the tar beat out of them. Anybody got the tar beat out if you're going for church? No, I never have gotten beat up just for going to church. They got the tar beat out of them just for going to church that morning. They're in prison, and they decided, hey, it's church time. It's Sunday night. It's time for church. So they fired up the evening service in spite of their wounds. They start singing and worshiping. Other prisoners are listening, and then verse 26 kicked in. How many of y'all say the first word? Suddenly, a strong earthquake shook the jail to its foundations. And the doors opened, and the chains fell from all the prisoners. Man, this is some kind of a scene, isn't it? And I, now, it looked like the perfect time to escape. In fact, if had I been there, and I'm this guy, and they beat me up this morning, and I'm singing tonight, and my chains fall off, I'm thinking, well, that must have been God telling me to get. So I'm not thinking about ministry right now. I'm going to get. Church is over. The Holy Spirit moved tonight at church. We had an earthquake, and all of our chains fell off. But they don't leave. Instead, they stayed on for the whole service. By the time church was over that night, the jailer and his whole family had been converted. They've come to Christ. He's took, the jailer takes them to his house, cleans them up, feeds them, takes care of them. And there's where the church of Philippi was born that night, just like that. Just like that. A sudden earthquake. Have you ever had that kind of experience with the Lord? Everything, like everything in your life was pointed in one direction. Have you ever had something like that going on? Everything was pointed in one direction. And maybe not in a good way. And then God suddenly showed up and changed everything and delivered you out of that particular situation. Has that happened to anybody in this room? It looked like you were maybe the business was going under. 
Look like the enemy had finally beaten you. It's all the way to midnight. At the very last minute, I mean you've gone to the very last minute discouraged and broken, hurting, can't understand why. Can you imagine Paul Paul thinking, why would God let this happen? I mean, we were doing this for him. Have you ever been in that situation where you were serving the Lord, you're doing your very best, and then the enemy comes against you, like, why would God let this happen? And then you feel, later on, you feel bad for questioning God after you realize what was happening because what's going on there is an earthquake's about to happen. God allows, sometimes allows you to be in those situations right up to the midnight hour. I mean, right up to the very last minute where... I mean, we're in this. There's, there's no way out of this. There's no way to change this. And right at the very last minute, suddenly God shows up and shakes everything about that circumstance until the chains from it fall away from your life. How did this happen? I mean, we went all this way. And then suddenly God showed up. Let's look at this third one. It's found in Acts chapter 28, verse 5 and 6. It's a sudden miracle. I love this story. Paul's on the Isle of Malta with a bunch of prisoners. They just went through a shipwreck. You know, I studied that one time and realized, I I don't know how it equates, but but, but historians equated that particular shipwreck to surviving an airplane crash. How many people know anybody that's ever survived an airplane crash? I I, I know somebody that did. He's not still alive, but I know somebody that did. Anybody else ever know anybody that survived an airplane crash? A couple of us, a couple of us. There's not a lot. I mean, we asked for that, and there's not a whole lot of hands going up. So Most people don't. This was a terrible shipwreck. But the Lord had given Paul a word. He said, hey, tell everybody to grab onto something, hang on. Everybody's going to make it. So the shipwrecks, everybody makes it to the shore. Hypothermia is about to set in. Paul Paul realizes we need a fire. And so he's gathering wood. He's just gathering up wood to build a fire. And a venomous snake comes out of the brush and latches onto him, onto his hand. Poisonous viper. This looks like it's going to be the end of Paul. The natives, they they figured he, they just, you know what, the, the Bible says the neighbors just figured he was a criminal and so that the gods had find, found a way, though he survived, he survived the shipwreck, but the gods were punishing him, and they were going to kill him anyway because he was a terrible criminal and deserved to die. That's what they thought because he's been bitten by this venomous viper, but that is not what is at all going on. So 28, verse 5 and 6, Paul shook the snake off into the fire, and he wasn't armed. The people kept thinking that Paul would either swell up or suddenly drop dead. There's that word again. They watched him for a long time and nothing happened, so they changed their mind. They said, this man is a God. Well, he wasn't a God, but he knew a mighty God. Have you ever been in that kind of a spot? You know, I was at a spot like that many years ago. Some of you have heard me tell the story probably because I've been here 30 years, so I've probably told it a time or two and I don't even remember but before I came here, I was a youth pastor in Fort Smith at a church called Evangel Temple, and I was also director for that whole section for missions or something. I don't remember what my title was. But I led a whole group of, of different youth groups and churches down to, uh, to this little town in Arkansas uh, to do a, a mission. There was a little church there that was about, it was drying up and about to die, and the whole idea was let's roll in and let's canvas the entire town. Let's canvas the whole, let's do an amazing service that night. Let's canvas the town. Let's invite everybody to it. Let's believe the Lord for powerful things. We're going to rejuvenate, revive this town and this church. And so, man, I mean, we, 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 uh, we did our diligence. We knew how to separate the town into grids, and we had all of our materials. We trained our people. We rolled in with our vans. We'd drop off loads here, here, and here. We had vans that were constantly circulating, keeping an eye on folks. And this was an area that it wasn't quite as bad as San Jose at 1030 at night. But it was pretty bad even during the day. I mean, people would say, that's a crack house. That's a house of ill repute. That's a, that's a that, that's that, that, that. Everything's boarded up. People are just sitting out in their yards, hopeless. Doing what you do when you're hopeless in the middle of the morning. Just sit out there and drink and smoke and wait to die. And we started canvassing up and down those streets. 
I remember one particular situation. I walked up to a group of men, and uh, they were sitting outside one of those houses. And I, I, the Holy Spirit was telling me, you know, you need to, you need to talk to those guys and, and minister to those guys. And so I went up, and I visited them. They were nice enough. But they said, do you want something to drink? And I said, no, 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 I'm good. I don't want any drink. They said, yeah, get that man a, get, go get that man a drink. Would you like some water? I'm like, no, no, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm good. I don't need anything. They said, yeah, go get him something to drink. And so here in a few minutes, somebody showed up and they handed me this drink. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking to myself, I can eat any deadly thing. I can drink any deadly thing. I don't know what these guys are up to, but I'm, I, you know, I don't want to be out here. I'm not going to be drinking. But at the same token, I'm having this conversation with them. And they're all, they're all leaning forward, you know, and aren't you thirsty? Have a drink, whatever. And I take a drink of something. It tasted kind of weird. It wasn't alcohol or what it was. And I hand the cup back to them. And then all of them kind of stand around looking at me. And I start going... Now, I wasn't drunk. I don't know what was in there. I still think they poisoned me. So I walk away from the house, and as I'm walking down the street, invited them, yeah, yeah, we'll come. One of them said, I got a date with Big Bertha tonight. I might be late. And all that, you know, with all that mess going on, right, talking all that smack, which wasn't a big deal to me. I was used to all that. I was like, yeah, 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 when you get done with her, come on and bring her with you, and all that, and whatever. And so... All this is going on, and I start walking away, and I look across the street, and I see some of my team, and they're over there doing their thing. And as I walk away, I notice this little kid on a bicycle, about eight years old. He rode up, and he's riding right beside me on his bike, and he's just looking at me. I say, he's waiting for me to die. <laughs> I, was like, I was like Paul in the story. I like Paul in the story, man. I'm, 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 I'm walking down the road, and I'm like, I'm, I'm about to go down. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm in the Lord's hands. He got me. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm jacked up real bad. But I'm walking along, and those guys, are they've stepped out now, Marty, from their house. They've walked out to the road. They've walked out, and they're going. <laughs> and this little kid's riding right along beside me, and he's looking up. And I start praying. Lord, you told me to go there. Lord, you said I could drink any deadly thing. I, Lord, I wasn't handling snakes. I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything. I didn't do nothing on purpose. I just did what you asked me to do. That kid rode his bike. He followed me way down the street. Finally, one of the vans saw me down there staggering around. They came, picked me up, put me in a van, drove me around. It took me about two hours to get, to get my head right. Figure out where I was at and get, get, get lined out, you know. And, uh. When I read this story, I always relate back to that personally. I always can relate back to this. I can relate back to Paul having that venomous snake on his hand. And he shakes it off and throws it in the fire. I had another little deal like that in Honduras years ago where a, a caterpillar, a real pretty caterpillar, real bright and vibrant green, was on one of our girls. And she screamed. And I didn't even think about it. I just reached over and hit it, knocked it off of her, and immediately... It was like thousands of needles shot through my hand and arm and all up into my shoulder. And one of the, some of the native kids was like, oh, oh, and they take off running. I'm like, well, I guess I've done it again. So they run down to the missionary. I get down there, and he's giving me that look. He's big old, big old Randy, Randy Herring, big old tough dude. He's looking at me kind of sideways. He said, did you hit one of them? green caterpillars with them all them prickly spikes all I said yeah he said how do you feel I said well I'm gonna be real honest with you I don't feel real good I'm burning my whole arm is on fire and I said and these kids keep standing around looking at me he said yeah they're waiting for you to die <laughs> he said usually people this happens to some of these people they they end up having to Go to the hospital or whatever. And so once again, I remember the scripture. I mean, I'm just like, okay, Lord, you know you, what you said, da 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 da. And he gave me a little bit of, I sat in a hammock for a minute or something, max, and then a little bit it went away and I kept on going. Sometimes you can find yourself in a spot where everybody is just waiting for you to die. Everybody's just waiting for you to quit. You ever been in that spot 
where everybody around, they're not doing a whole lot to help you. They're just watching because they don't want to miss it when you go down. Anybody ever been in that kind of a situation? Some of y'all might be there right now. Man, this job's eating me up, Pastor. This situation is tearing us up. I'm, not get, I'm calling out to the Lord. I'm not, get, I'm not getting a lot of help from anybody. I'm still here. I don't know what's going on, but I'm tell, it feels like everybody's just watching, just sitting around waiting for me to die. Everybody's just watching me like they think I'm going to die. And everybody said you'd never recover from it, but you did. Because just like Paul, at some point, suddenly, you were able to shake this off. Somebody said, how did you do that? He said, I don't really know how I did it. I just, I just, just the Holy Ghost to help me. I just did it. I just shook it off in the fire. Hey, anybody ever been there? Am I talking to anybody? You were in a situation where everybody around you said, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. We're all sitting around here. We're just here to console you until you die. We're just here to console you. You're like, no, I'm not going anywhere. The Lord is with me. I'm walking with him. I'm, sh- I'm going to shake this off. I'm, I'm gonna sh- and suddenly you shake that snake off into the fire where it belongs. You knew if it, had, if it, if it hadn't been for God, you'd have, it'd been over for you. You know that. Some of you know that. He's always come through for you. I love the old song we used to sing when I was a kid. He's an on-time God. Anybody remember that song? He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. You remember that? Man, I've been singing that over in my office this morning, walking around. We hadn't sang that song in 40 years, probably. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. Remember? He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Right? Hey, I hear you. He knows exactly when it's time to show up. You might think he's late. You might think he forgot. But he knows when the all of the sudden moment comes. I want, to, I want to tell you what the word, that suddenly word that I gave you, everywhere I gave it to you from in Scripture this morning, in that context, everywhere that I gave it to you, it meant the same thing. You ready me to tell you what it meant in the Greek? You say, yeah, it meant suddenly. Well, it meant something else. You ready for this? Write this down. Every place there, it means unexpectedly. So in every case that we talked about, they either hadn't started expecting or they were past expecting. Get that in your soul. They either hadn't started expecting or else they were past expecting. What does that mean? So you think about Paul. He's on the donkey. He's just going to do what he thinks is right. And suddenly, unexpectedly, he gets knocked off a donkey and his life has changed. Hmm? He gives his life right, gets start, starts serving the Lord. He's doing his thing. He's trying to preach and win converts now. He's trying to turn around and do good since he's done bad so long. And all of a sudden, he's thrown in prison, and then suddenly, he is free. He gets on a boat, and he's headed to, 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 to answer up to charges, and on a boat with a bunch of prisoners, and they have a shipwreck. Nobody should have lived through it. They all did, and he, and he makes it through the shipwreck, and then he gets bit by the snake. And then suddenly, God shows up. And he shakes it off into the fire. In every one of those cases in Paul's life, he either wasn't expecting or he was past expecting. What do I mean by that? When he's walking around with a snake hanging off his hand, and everybody, including him, knows he's probably about to die. He's walking around. They, don't, they can't run him down to the urgent care. They're not going to run him down to urgent care. They're not going to run him down to the emergency room. He's on the Isle of Malta 2,000 years ago. I don't think they probably even have a medical clinic. They all just know if you get bit by one of them, you die. That's it. It's over. He's walking around with a snake hanging off, throws it in the fire, and then he has a decision to make. Well, should I lay down and die or should I just keep gathering wood? Because we're past expecting God to do anything. This thing bit me. He didn't do anything when he was biting me. Somebody say amen. You ever been there? It bit me. I, pray. I didn't want to get bit. I would have prayed not to get bit. I got up that morning and prayed, don't let nothing bite me. Anybody pray that prayer? God, don't let nothing bite me today. Don't let nothing bite me. I got up this morning praying, God, don't let nothing bite me. And it bit me. I don't know where the Lord was when all that happened, but I got bit. So I'm, I never started expecting once I got bit by this snake. 
I either never started to expect or I'm past expecting anything to happen. I mean, here we are. I guess I'll just keep doing what I was doing. Somebody say amen. I guess I'll just keep gathering firewood. I guess I'll just keep on preaching. I guess I'll just keep on witnessing. I guess, I, I guess I'll just keep on living. I guess I'll just keep on ministering to people. I guess I'll just keep on giving and doing all the things I've always done. I got this snake hanging off my hand, but I'm not dead yet. Somebody say, I'm not dead yet. He's an on-time God. And here in about a minute, he's going to say, okay, it's time. Suddenly, suddenly he shows up and says, shake it off. Throw it in the fire. Mm. Even when your friends have already started consoling you. Anybody got any friends like Job had? When your friends have already started consoling you. When they've already pulled up their chairs and they're giving you that look like, Oh man, it's too bad. We know you're not going to make it, but we love you. We know we're not going to make it through this one, Pastor. You're not going to make it through this one. But we're going to ride the bicycle right along beside you until you fall down dead. Do we can see? Huh? We know you might not make it through this one, Pastor. And suddenly God, I want you to hear this. Suddenly God can save that loved one you've been worried about. When it's way past expecting. They've gone so far now you don't even expect anymore. <laughs> it's too hard to even expect anymore. They've, they've lived so long. They've gone so far from God. They've, gotten, they've wandered from him so far. That you don't even, you past expecting. You, you're praying, but you're past expecting that. I don't think they'll ever come back. I don't think they'll ever. And suddenly God can save them. And that one that's bound and discouraged. And, and the doctor says, you know, he or she have drank to the point that they, they, they don't have no liver. They don't have no kidneys. They, if they live, they wouldn't have any kind of quality. Suddenly God can deliver that one who's bound and discouraged. Suddenly God can heal. Suddenly God can perform the miracle on behalf of the ones whom it seems like even a miracle. Some of you have been in a situation where it seemed like even a miracle would be too late. It'd be too late for even a miracle. to. Have you ever been there? It would be too late for even a miracle to fix this. I've been in situations where I've told Deb, I said, I don't see how in this or any other parallel universe this could ever be okay. Have you ever done that? I didn't say I was always positive. They said, Pastor, that, that, you're not being very positive. I was being real positive. I was being real positive. This wasn't going to work. I was real positive. I was positive it wasn't going to go good. And I said, I don't see how this could ever be. I don't see how this could ever be okay. This will never. There's no, even God can't fix this. And suddenly God show up. He said, you, you don't know what you're talking about. I've just been waiting until you would get to this point. So that you wouldn't be able to say anybody else did it. You can't, you can't say the doctor fixed this. You can't say the lawyer fixed this. You can't say your mama fixed this. You can't say nobody fixed this. I'm the only one could have done this because it was already past expecting. And suddenly, God, suddenly, God. Some of y'all need to hear that this morning. He's a sudden God. He's an unexpected God. He's an on-time God. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're facing. He, he hadn't forgot you. He's not on vacation. He, he's not distracted. He's not disinterested. He's not disabled. He's on his way. Hang on, brother. Hang on, sister. He's on his way. He's coming. Just like that, suddenly and expectedly, God's going to show up and come through for you again. He always has. I got to leave you with one more verse of scripture. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. On the day of Pentecost. All the Lord's followers were together in one place. I want you all to say it with me. Suddenly. <laughs> there it is. Suddenly there was a noise from heaven like the sound of a mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were meeting. Maybe today is a time for another sudden move of God to fill this house. Maybe this is the day that you get your salvation like Paul got his. Maybe this is the day you get your deliverance like Paul got his that day. Maybe this is your day that you get your miracle like Paul got his that day. But that suddenness, that sudden move, that sudden wind of God is here to move hell itself if necessary on your behalf. <laughs> Pastor, I am past the point. I am past the point. I'm past the point. 
of being able to expect. Our situation has become so de- desperate. And we have prayed. And we've sought and we've done everything we could do. We prayed about it. And we, there, we are past the point of even an expectation at this point. And God said, are you done? Are you done? Yeah, God, I'm done. I got nothing left. I'm just going to walk around with this snake hanging off of me. But I'm not going to quit you. I'm going to walk around with this snake. I'm just going to keep gathering wood. I'm just going to keep on living, serving you. I may not have a real good attitude, Lord. Forgive me. Because it's hard to be excited with a snake hanging off your hand. It's hard for me to have a good attitude. It's hard for me to be real positive. It's hard for me to smile. But I'm just going to keep on, Lord. I'm going to keep on. God says, he's going to know at the point that you've gotten desperate enough. He's going to know at the point that you just, you're like, God, I'm, I, picked up that, I picked up that piece of wood, but I don't think I can pick up another one. I will try. And God knows when you're going to get to the point that you just don't have the strength left anymore and the energy and the resources to pick up wood and fight the snake. And then he's going to say, okay, I'm going to show up right now. I'm on time. Suddenly, unexpectedly, I'm going to deliver you. Who am I talking to today? Needs a needs a, needs the suddenness of God. If you need God to suddenly show up, stand up right where you're at. I need this was my word today. I need sudden I need a suddenly God. If you can't stand up, lift your hand. I need a sudden. I need that sudden on time God. You don't have to come down here. Lift up both your hands right there where you're at. Lift up both your hands. Church, come on. You've been in a situation. If you're not standing, you have, you've, had, you've been in a situation where you would have had to stand. There's times where you would have had to stand, or there may be a time coming that you're going to need to remember this message. But you're like, today I'm in that situation. I want to get rid of this snake. Some of you may need to stand up this morning because you need, you need to give your heart to Jesus. Now, most I see these people standing. That's not the case. But there's some, some of you, it may be the case. I need, to get, I need to give my heart to Jesus. Stand up with them. Suddenly, God can save you. Some of you, you need an earthquake. You need an earthquake to shake loose this pain and this despair and this discouragement that you found yourself in. And some of you need that miracle of healing. Whatever it is, this unexpected this sudden God can show up in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus the name above all names the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord the anointed Messiah the one who sits at the right hand of power in heaven next to the Father the one who is coming to get his children, the one who is in charge of all things, the one who has created all and merely speaks the word in the name of Jesus, in the name, the mighty name above all names, in the name of Jesus, I pray, oh God, that snakes will start falling in the fire. Be that sudden God right now. Be that on-time God right now. Suddenly, I pray God, suddenly, like just like the wind blew in that room. Everybody was praying and suddenly you showed up. Show up right now, I pray in the name of Jesus. Show up right now and set these people free and save them and deliver them and heal them. And do miracles in their lives. Suddenly, Lord, I pray, let today be that day in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Shake off that snake. Some of us needed the light to come and wake us up. Some of us need the earthquake to shake and deliver us. And some of us need the miracle to take place and revive us. And our on time 
suddenly out of nowhere unexpected God knows you and knows what's going on in your life you are not here by mistake you are not here by mistake God brought you to this place today why because he loves you so much that he singled you out out of everywhere you could have been on this planet and some of you probably even had other places you wanted to go and you don't even know why you're here but God brought you to this moment because he wanted to remind you that he loves you he cares for you he's in control he's in control of everything that you will let him be in control of and anything that you hang on to is just going to be a is just going to make suffering for you but everything that you will turn loose of I know who I believed in and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day everything that I commit to him he promises that he will take Lord I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of every one of these people who are standing I expect to hear tremendous things I expect to hear miracles I expect to hear stories and testimonies of how today something happened something cha- something changed something broke off today it was just sudden it was out of it was just unexpected and out of nowhere but God showed up in their life I thank you Jesus church all over the room won't you just lift your hands and worship him for a minute just lift your hand and worship say thank you Lord for the word thank you for the word thank you for the encouragement thank you Jesus thank you for the encouragement seated I want you to re- I want you to receive I want you to receive that word though today don't let the devil try to lie to you and tell you when you leave that it that it wasn't real don't let him tell you that it wasn't legitimate don't let him tell you that he's a liar he's a liar next Sunday we're going we're going to set we're going to set some folks right up here and they're going to tell you some stories it's going to blow your mind and some of you today are going to show up here next week and be able to be able to join them you may not put you on the platform because I may not know but you're going to be able to join them in saying last week last week I shook that snake off last week that earthquake set me free last week that light came on Last week, God showed up. Amen? We got nine sweet babies who are right here. They're going to come out on this platform right now. Come all the way across. If you would, Garrett, make plenty of room. Good to see y'all. Amen. How exciting. How exciting is this? Amen? Come on across. Come on across. There's my buddy Kingston right there. Kingston. Man, how are you? How are you? Look at here. Victor, you're just helping out. <clears throat> Diana, he's just helping out. <clears throat> Come on out. Come on out. <laughs> it's sweet. Come on. <laughs> We got some pretty pictures to put up. Man, you know this is a big day. Trent done went and got his hair cut. It's a big day, Emily. There are some great stories, right? I wish I could pass the mic because there are some some great stories of how God has intervened right here on this stage and done some miraculous and amazing things. 
Isn't this fun? I know I'm not supposed to turn my back on the crowd, but I want to talk to them for a minute. So here's the thing. Baby dedications are fun and sweet, and, and we love these moments, but these are not for the babies. As we could dedicate these babies all day long, then we could go sprinkle them, we could do all kinds of stuff, and it will not save them. None of that will save them. The only thing that will save these children is when they get old enough to reach what's called the age of accountability. It's different for different people, but at some point they're going to get old enough to realize the difference between right and wrong. They're going to realize as you talk to them about Jesus, they're going to realize that he loves them and he wants to save them. And they're going to give their heart to Jesus and then they'll be saved. Nothing up to that's going to save them. You say, then why are we doing this? It's for you. It's for parents. You say, what do we got to do with it? This dedication to them means they're going to get a certificate and a Bible. But it means that you are making a commitment. You're making a commitment God gave you these babies. He trusted these babies to you. You're making a commitment to him that you're going to raise them in his fear and admonition. That you're going to raise them the right way. So that when they reach that age of accountability, they'll have that, they'll have that decision to make. They'll know about it. My heart breaks for families that never take their babies to church. Because those children grow up and they don't know the truth. They don't have a foundation to come back. But you're giving these children a foundation the scripture said, if you train them up in the way they should go, they'll never depart from it. Now, I know some kids that have gotten away. They got off track. Some of us were those kids. Are we not? We were raised, we raised in church, but we walked away from the Lord. But we made our way home because we knew how to. We knew where to come. These kids would never have that opportunity without you. This is about you. It's about you making that commitment, that dedication, so that th these children will be able to know who Jesus is. So that when conviction comes and he, heart, he tugs at their heart, They'll be able to pray that prayer, and you'll be able to lead them in it. It's a wonderful thing to lead your children to Jesus. There's nothing like being the one to get to lead your kid to Christ. Amen? So will you make that commitment today? Will you say, we're, we're here, Pastor, and we're going to be here. We'll have these babies in his house. We're going to give them that chance by having them in his house. We're going to pray at home. We're going to read the word. We're going to teach them about Jesus. Will you do Because if you won't do that, then you... you all we're doing today is getting a certificate in the Bible. Church, then you commit. You make a commitment that you're going to do your best in every, every area of ministry as they, write, as they grow up. You're going to help guide and direct and minister to these children. I say it to, to uh, the extended families. There's a lot of extended family here today. And I don't know how you live in your house. I don't know what you believe. But I want, you to, I want, I want to tell you this. I want you to make a commitment. I want to tell you this, that when these children are in your care, you should remember this day and you should honor and you should live the kind of life that parents are trying to live. You should create the same atmosphere in your house that they're trying to create for them every day. And so I commission you as extended family. When they're in your care, act right. Do right. Amen? Church, will we accept, our, will we accept, accept this today? Then I want every one of you, if you would, extend your hand this direction. It's just like you're laying your hand on their shoulder. And I want to pray, Jesus, you see, these, you see these parents, you see these families. What a blessing these babies are. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to lay my hand on their, on their head. What a blessing these babies are. How blessed we are today, Jesus to have these babies in our life. How blessed we are, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And I pray, God, in Jesus' name that your anointing would be in these houses, that, God, in these homes, you would provide for these financially, spiritually, emotionally, in every way. Let these homes be solid and stable places for your babies to grow up. Provide for them in every way. Let these children be raised in such a way that God, someday they grow up, not, not only just to know you, but Lord, that there's babies, there's children on this platform someday that will, that will be missionaries and pastors, teachers and, and evangelists and, and, and violent workers in their church and Christian businessmen and women, and Christian politicians, people that are going to make a difference in their world for the right reasons and in the right way 
And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Deb has a little certificate to give each one of you. And you can, you can put it in a little frame and hang it on the wall. And someday they might ask you what that is. And you'll have a chance to tell them. Amen. And also, we didn't bring these out because there's too many. It's a big old stack of Bibles. They're too heavy. But we got a Bible. We want to, some of them may already have their first Bible, but we, but we, we want to give them their first Bible from Trinity Fellowship as a family. We want that gift to be to your child. And so we have a little Bible for you back there. It's a really fun Bible for them, for children, and for you to read to them the stories. You can read stories every night out of that Bible to them. God bless y'all. What an honor. I am honored to have the opportunity to be here and do this today. Thank you for trusting me with this. God bless you. Church, put your hands together. Thank y'all. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank y'all. Again, thank you. See you, buddy. Amen. Amen. Congratulations, all y'all. What a great day. Man, I'm looking forward to next Sunday. Put it down in your day book. Don't, don't miss next Sunday. Amen. God bless you. Victor has a couple things to share, and then we're going we're gonna to be dismissed. Love y'all. Yes, amen. Amen. Yes, hello. Amen. All righty. What an amazing day. Church, how do we feel about our guests today? Yes, we're so grateful you could join us today. If you want to join us at the kiosk outside, then we have a gift for you guys. And there's a QR code in front of your chair. And it, it's going to do everything. And it's going to take you to everything that you need to know to get connected here at Trinity. We have a couple of announcements here in the screens in a, in a couple seconds. We have our tithes and offerings. So there's a couple ways to give. You can text to give. You can do it online. Or you can do it on, there's ushers outside the doors. And just a, one announcement. We have men's and women's tonight at 5. We would love for you to join us. And that's about it. You guys have an amazing day. Enjoy the rest of your day.